In this Luminar Neo editing series, we're going to take this landscape here and transform it into something much more inviting to look at. But this photo editing series isn't so much about editing this particular photo as it is sharing tools and editing solutions that you will be able to adopt and start applying to your own photo editing workflow. So in this first video, let's take a look at how we can set ourselves up for editing success by making the most of the develop raw tool. And I'm also going to share with you a really nifty trick at the end where we can maximize the detail available to us in our file as well. So stick around for that. Right, let's get into it. So this is our raw photo, an image taken of the Glenorchy Lakes in New Zealand. As we can see in the right hand side of the catalog view here, we are working with a raw photo, F8, 100th of a second. This was taken on a tripod and this was ISO 200. So we have got quite a bit of work to do to bring this raw file to life. So I'm going to jump into the edit section and that's going to give us access to our first tool that we want to apply to any development we want to do and that is develop raw. Currently I have the Luminar default profile applied which is a pretty flat profile. We also have access to Adobe Standard, which I also don't really love. If you can, the best thing to do is apply a camera matching profile. Now here you can see we have camera landscape. Personally, I really don't like this because it oversaturates and over accentuates the contrast in our image. I much prefer to work with either a camera flat or a camera neutral profile. That is actually going to give us the biggest dynamic range to work with. And I'll choose camera flat as my profile. Now, when I've mentioned profiles before, sometimes I get comments from people saying, I don't see the option for profiles. If that's the case, it's possible that either you're not using a raw file, therefore you won't have access to the profiles to talk to that raw file. Or alternatively, you may have already applied another tool, which will mean that develop raw is no longer available in the tools section. You need to jump to the edit section and then you will see develop raw again. So just to make that point clear, if I close down develop raw and let's say I put a little bit of accent AI on, you will see that develop raw is now changed to develop. And if I went into there, I no longer see those profiles available to me. So if that is the case, what you need to do is jump to the edit section and you will always have access to that develop raw, providing you are using a raw file. And there we can come in and select our profiles. If you don't have different profiles available to you, just write profiles in the comments and I'll put a link to a video that should help you sort that out. Now, if we want to come in and start working with our exposure and either brighten or darken down our photo, currently we're working off our eye, just visually checking the brightness. Now, that's not really what we want to be able to do. Sure, we want to trust our eye, but at the same time, it's good to have a precise representation of our highlights, shadows, all of that good stuff. So we need our histogram. So if we don't see it on the right hand side over here, what we need to do is come over to where we see the little Luminar Neo icon, click the down arrow, come to view, and then at the bottom of the view options, we'll see show histogram. And when I click that, uh, now we have it, our histogram. And you can see that with that exposure adjustment, my data was starting to get pushed off the right hand side, showing me I was overexposing my data. If I double click the exposure, it's gonna reset it. And I actually like the shape of this histogram. I'm not losing any information on the left hand side or the right, meaning I have a full tonal distribution available to me at the moment, which is perfect. But currently I feel like we don't have as much information in the shadows as I would like. So I'm just gonna grab the slider and start bringing that up. Now you can see if I get really heavy handed with that, it really reveals a lot of information in the shadows. However, we start to lose that lovely contrast that we had initially where the trees in the foreground cause this natural vignette that we've got that force the viewer's eye to look through to the seat and the beautiful mountains behind. So we don't want to destroy that completely, but we do want to lift those shadows so that we have access to that information. I'm also going to grab the highlight slider and just have a little play with that and see if I have any benefit by moving that left or right. Usually with the highlights, I will end up bringing it down to the left just to make sure that we have that highlight detail protected in this initial develop rule process. The next step is we want to make sure that we have a pure white point and a pure black point in our photo. Now, if I just randomly move these sliders down and up, you can see that it's not very precise in making sure that we're not blowing out these white highlights here or crushing down the details in our shadows to pure black. I don't actually like using these sliders to achieve that end. What I prefer to do is actually open up curves 
and grab this top right hand point which represents the whites and actually move that over keeping an eye on the histogram and as I move this over to the left you can see that we start brightening up the whole photo so anything that falls to the right of this point is actually going to pure white so we want to set this up so that we're just starting to hit pure white and the way that we can see that as an easy visual representation is with these red dots all you do is press J on your keyboard and that's going to give you these highlight clipping warnings so what we want to do is just move this over until we start to see those reds just start to appear and currently I don't even need to move that over before we're already getting parts of this image going to pure white but in this case I'm not too worried about the detail in these very brightest areas here so I am just going to bring this over ever so slightly to brighten up this photo and now I'm going to do the same thing with the black point and move that over until we just start to see these blue warnings that are saying these pixels have gone to pure black Usually if we have a really minimal amount of the blue highlight warnings representing the very darkest pixels and a minimal amount of the red highlight warnings, we're in a pretty good place. So if I toggle the before and the after, you can see that already we've brought back a lot of detail in the photo and given ourselves a much wider dynamic range to work with. And if that sounds like gobbledygook, what's a dynamic range? All that refers to is the tonal ranges in our image. You don't want things crushed down to black or blown out in pure white. You want a nice even distribution of tones during this initial setup stage of your processing because that's gonna give you the greatest flexibility when you start to apply other tools and the software is gonna have access to all of that tonal information and give you much better results along the way. The next section in Develop Raw is all about dealing with color. And the first slider that we have is the temperature slider. This allows us to either cool down our image, push it into the blues, or push them into the oranges, which gives it a warmer look. Now, personally, even though I like to inject color looks, color washes into my photos, I don't like to do it at this stage. During this initial develop raw stage, the most important thing is that we get the colors accurate. So we want to maintain the blue in the sky whilst also maintaining the true color of the foliage as well. Currently, it's actually really hard to see the color in the foliage because everything's just a little tepid, a little desaturated. And so now is the best time to add saturation in our image. We can always bring that down later, but while we're working with this raw file, that is the best time to introduce the color. It's much harder to add that color in later. Now, I don't like to push things too far. I just like to give it a nice little pop so that when I'm working with the color tools, they've actually got something to grab hold of rather than an almost desaturated image. The next two sections, sharpness and noise reduction, are all about just cleaning up our photo. Now in this image, you can see it's not very sharp, particularly in the background of the photo. I'm guessing that I actually focused probably somewhere around the seat. So we may need to add a fair bit of sharpening to this one just to clean it up. Usually I find 50% with the radius and masking settings left as they are, normally does a really good job. If you push the sharpen up too far, that's when you start to get these ugly little halos around objects, which is not what we want. So I normally go for that 50% mark because it's a nice balance between starting to see the halos, but if we zoom out, they're not really that visible. Although having said that, now I've brought my attention to them. They are quite visible to me. So look, maybe let's go for about 30 on this particular example. Now, if you're watching this, I'm sure you've already got Luminar Neo, but if you want to get hold of some new assets from Marketplace, anything like that, Skylum are currently running a Halloween special for Luminar. I'll put a link to it in the description below, along with an additional discount coupon code. So you're welcome to help yourself to that as well. Right, back to the edit. Now, noise reduction. For this particular file, we were at ISO 200. I really don't feel we need to worry about Luminar's dedicated noiseless AI tools. I think we can achieve what we want just by putting in a little bit of luminosity noise reduction. Now this may be hard to see on YouTube, but what I want to say is I don't want to completely destroy any noise in my photo. I'm happy to just minimize it. So I don't know, somewhere around this sort of like 17 mark is fine for this photo. And now as we jump into the optic section, which has tools inside here, which are designed to correct any lens abnormalities. Now the main one I normally use is auto distortion corrections. 
If you're photographing architecture, things with straight lines, this is vitally important. However, when I'm working with landscapes, unless I see a bow in the horizon, I will usually actually leave this unchecked. Now, if I actually grab the lens distortion slider, it will be easier for me to explain why that is. Now, if I take this to the left, we get an effect known as barrel distortion. And if I take it to the right, we get an effect known as pin cushioning. So if your lens suffers from one or other of those, you can actually move this in the opposite direction to correct for it. However, the problem is when we move these sliders to correct for the distortion, we're actually manipulating pixels in the photo. So particularly at the edge of the frame, pixels are actually getting stretched. So I prefer just to leave my pixels exactly as they were on the sensor. And so for landscapes, most of the time I leave that alone. However, auto fix chromatic aberration and auto defringe are usually worth applying because if you do get any color anomalies, strange magenta or cyan edging around things, it tends to get rid of that for you, which is obviously a good thing. And now the final section here, transform, is something that again for landscapes, we don't really need to worry about that. It's more useful when we're actually trying to fix architecture and things like that. So now I'm happy with what I've done in Develop Raw. I'm just gonna close that tool down. I'm also gonna throw away that Accent AI that I put on there as a little tester before, so we just see Develop Raw. Let me toggle our before and our after, before and after. I'm also gonna press J on the keyboard to get rid of those highlight warnings so we can get a better idea of this. And already you can see that we've made a lot of improvements to this photo just with that one Develop Raw tool. We've improved the shadow detail, we've improved the contrast, we've improved the color accuracy, we've improved the color saturation. On a pixel level, we've improved the sharpness of the photo, we've improved the noise level of the photo. It's all looking pretty good. So now we've done what I consider to be the basics of prepping the file, let's just add a couple of extra effects. So Enhance AI, if you don't know, wow, what a tool this is. Accent AI in here is designed to use AI to make multiple improvements to our photo from where it was to where it got to. As it is, this is far too much because it is compounding the Accent AI on top of that Develop Raw that we've already done. So Develop Raw had already got things looking pretty good, as you can see here. So Accent AI, we don't need to go too heavy handed with that to get the most out of it. Now, if you don't wanna go through all those steps with Develop Raw that I showed you, you can just come straight in and just use Accent AI. And usually that will do a very good job of sorting out so many things with your photo. But for me, what I like to do is manually correct the photo with Develop Raw and then just add a little tickle of Enhance AI on top of that. Now, in my previous four part editing series with the Lighthouse, I showed you three different ways to start your photo edit, Develop Raw, Enhance AI, and also HDR Merge. Now I showed those independently. What I'd like to do with this photo is show you how the, we can combine all three of those excellent methods for starting our photo edit to give us the best of all three of those worlds. So we've already done Dev Raw, we've also done Enhance AI. Let's also add in some HDR merge as well. And so to do that, I'm going to come to the catalog, which is gonna give me access to HDR merge, focus stacking, pano stitching, all of that good stuff. So it's HDR merge that we want to work with. So I'm just gonna drag the file and drop it into HDR merge. Now, usually you'd have a series of bracketed photos, i.e. different exposures that the software is gonna to bring together to bring back all of the rich dynamic range that we talked about before, but we can also do it with one photo. So I'm just gonna click merge on that one photo. And just like that, it has popped out the result. You can see I've got another version right next to it from when I did a little test run before recording this. And one thing you'll notice as I open that up is all of that color work and everything is no longer there in this file. And that is because the HDR merge tool is using the raw photo without any of those edits that we apply. It just uses the raw photo. So now to get the best of both worlds, it is up to us to combine this with what we did before. So I'm gonna jump back to the catalog, come back to the photo we were just working on. And now what I'm going to do is load in that HDR merge over the top of this as a new layer. So to do that, I come to the layer section, 
click the plus icon and then go and find the HDR merge folder, which on PC is inside pictures and just double click the name of the file and then we click on it and now it is loaded in. So if I drop the opacity, what we're gonna see is the version we created before with develop raw and a little bit of enhance AI. Now, if I push the opacity all the way to 100, we see the develop raw version. We can also flick between the two by hiding this layer and then showing it. So what we could do is either just go for a 50-50 split and we can do that by double clicking on that little button or what I could do is come in and just mask this effect only where I want it. So what I may do is push it all the way to 100 and just cast my eye around the scene and think, okay, where is this interesting me? So I quite like what it's done for the mountain in the background. And I also like a lot of the detail that it's brought out in these lovely trees in the foreground as well. So I'm gonna come into the masking section and choose an appropriate brush. I don't wanna set the strength too high, maybe about a third of the way up, so 33%. Keep the softness set to 100. I always like to work with a nice soft brush and just so we can get things done quickly, let's pump the size nice and high all the way to 400. So now when I click and start painting, we're gonna see a slightly red tinge coming over the photo. That is the mask I'm creating. I haven't let go of the mouse yet and when I do, now we can see that where that red was, we've now got a third 33% of that effect painted in. I can do the same over this side and just paint that same amount over the trees and release. I also like the look of it over the mountain and I liked it so much that I'm gonna double down on this effect and just go a little heavier here. And perhaps we do want just a little bit over the seat as well, just to bring attention there. And if I come out of layer properties and now we hide this layer and then show it again, we've pretty much got the best of everything. So if I show our absolute original, this is our raw untouched file and now release. This has a little bit of develop raw, a little bit of HDR merge and a little bit of enhance AI as well, before and after, before and after. So depending on your preference for photo editing, that may do you, you may draw a line in the sand underneath that and say, I'm happy with that photo edit. It's nice and realistic, it's as it was captured and you're good to go. However, for me, I like to massage my photos, get the most out of them and try to create something really artistic and to present to the viewer, not just what I saw when I was there, but also how I felt when I was there as well. So join me for part two, where I'll share some of my favorite and surprising ways for controlling light in our photo. And when that's ready, that video should be popping up right there. Okay, thanks so much guys, I'll see you in that one.